Hello everyone, welcome back to Ways of the World, a brief global history with sources. As we sum up our study of the worlds of Christendom, contraction, expansion, and division. Our study today will be the West in comparative perspective. <clears throat> Alright, so let's start with catching up. All right, the hybrid civilization of Western Europe was less developed than Byzantium, China, India, or the Islamic world. Muslims regarded Europeans as barbarians, and Europeans recognized their own backwardness. Europeans were happy to exchange with or borrow from more advanced civilizations to the east, and European economies rec uh, reconnected with the Eurasian trading system. Europe was a developing civilization, like others of the era. By 1500, Europe had caught up with China and the Islamic world, surpassed them even in some areas. And from 500 to 1300, that was a period of great innovation in terms of agriculture, uh, new reliance on non-animal sources of energy, uh, technological borrowing for warfare with even further development, and Europe developed a passion for technology. All right, European technology. Uh, Europeans' fascination with technology and their religious motivation for investigating the world are apparent in this 13th century portrayal of God as a divine engineer, um, laying out the world with a huge compass. So how does this image of God using a compass to lay out the world demonstrate the broader cultural framework of Europe in the 13th century? Well, the image demonstrates how Europeans attempted to apply rational thought epitomized by the compass in the portrayal of God as a divine engineer, to theology, the quote-unquote queen of the sciences. European thinkers sought to use logic, philosophy, and rationalism in the service of Christ. <clears throat> Excuse me. All right, pluralism in politics. So Europe crystallized into a system of competing states, and the political pluralism shaped European, excuse me, Western European civilization, led to frequent wars and militarization, but it also stimulated technological development. And states were still able to communicate economically and intellectually. And rulers were generally weaker than those to the east. The royal, noble, ecclesiastical power struggle allowed urban merchants to win great independence, and perhaps paved the way for capitalism. And the development of representative institutions uh, like uh, parliaments. <clears throat> Art, reason, and faith. Now, there's a distinctive intellectual tension between faith and reason that developed. Uh, intellectual faith flourished in the centuries after 1000, and there's a creation of universities from earlier cathedral schools, and scholars had some intellectual freedom at universities. Now, within these universities, some scholars began to emphasize the ability of human reason to understand divine mysteries. Um, they also applied reason to law, medicine, and the world of nature. And there's the development of quote-unquote natural philosophy, which is the scientific study of nature. And there's also a search for the classical Greek texts, especially Aristotle. And they were found in Byzantium in the Islamic world. In the 12th and through the 12th and 13th centuries, um, they had access to these ancient Greek and Arab scholarship writings and manuscripts. And there's a deep impact of Aristotle on Europe. His writings were the basis of university education, and it dominated Western European thought between 1200 and 1700. But there's no similar development that occurred in the Byzantine Empire. The focus of education was on the humanities, and there's a, even a suspicion of classical Greek thought. And the Islamic world had a deep interaction with classical Greek thought. There's a massive amount of translation um, between the 9th and 10th centuries. It encouraged the flowering of Arab scholarship between 800 and 1200. And that caused a debate among Muslim thinkers on faith and reason. And the Islamic world uh, eventually turned against natural philosophy. All right, European univer university life in the Middle Ages. So this 14th century manuscript painting shows the classroom scene from the University of um, Bologna in Italy. Note the sleeping and disruptive students. Some things apparently never change. So what comparisons can you make between this image and your own history classroom? 
Well, you know, that might change, and it, it'll vary depending on, you know, the makeup and the layout of the modern classroom or your own classroom. But you should note that one teacher is leading students, some of whom are disinterested, through the use of written material. Um, and we've done that frequently in our class, albeit uh, there's a lot less lecture. Now, they, you might also note that all of the students are male, which is significantly different than your classroom today. All right, uh, this is the Lindisfarne Gospel. Uh, monks viewed the copying of holy works as acts of faith and piety. And with this in mind, why might Edfrith, um, the monk that wrote this, have so elaborately decorated his manuscript? Well, this is the opening page of a gospel which relates the life of Christ. So the gospels are the foundational books of the New Testament and thus would likely have been one of the most elaborately decorated. Moreover, the time and effort put into this illuminated manuscript created over the course of oh, 20, 23 years was a poignant display of Adfrith's religious devotion. In what ways was, was this page an example of cultural syncretism in 7th century Europe? What well, uses pre-Christian Celtic and Germanic symbolism in its patterns, swirls, and animals to relate to a Christian message? Let's talk about the purpose of the document. How might the incorporation of Celtic and Germanic artistic styles have widened the appeal of this Christian text? Well, stylization would likely have grabbed the attention of a Celtic or Germanic reader with those familiar artistic styles. Well, it is unlikely that he or she would be literate and thus unable to read the text. He or she would feel comfortable with it and identify with it, giving the priest the opportunity to explain the content and ideally lead to that individual's conversion and ongoing engagement with Christianity. All right. Um, the Asian Palace Chapel. What does the placement of Charlemagne's throne tell us about how he viewed his power and authority as an emperor? And to help you guys out, that is the throne right there. Okay, so Charlemagne, who was crowned emperor by the Pope in 800, saw himself as God's appointed ruler on earth. And therefore, he occupied in an intermediate space between God and man, with nobles, churchmen, and the altar on the lower level, and the throne on the second floor. And that positioned Charlemagne... Um, or his subjects, and the dome ceiling depicting the 24 elders adoring the throne of God. Let's analyze the ways in which the chapel illustrates the use of Latin Christian symbolism to support Germanic royalty, royal authority. Now, Germanic royal authority, epitomized by Charlemagne's throne here in the church, is surrounded by Latin Christian symbolism, specifically the Roman arches, the Roman columns, and the Roman marble. It was also designed to echo two important Roman imperial churches, the Holy Sepulchre in Jerusalem and the San Vitale in Ravenna. And that concludes our study of the West in comparative perspective. I will see you guys for the next, uh, the next study.